One of the most important factors in determining the solubility of a gas in a liquid is the pressure of that gas over the liquid. Let's imagine that we have a sealed container where we have such a gas over such a liquid. Now the gas, its molecules will strike the surface of the liquid and there's a small probability that they will be absorbed into the liquid. The molecules which have been absorbed into the liquid will sometimes make their way to the surface and have a small probability of escaping into the gas phase. If we wait a while, we eventually reach an equilibrium where the same quantity are being absorbed as are being released, and we have our, our pressure of the gas. Now imagine we do something to perturb this equilibrium. We go ahead and take the lid of the container, which is actually a piston, and we move it downward, so we cut the volume in half. What this does is it doubles the pressure. All the molecules are more packed tightly together in the gas phase, and because they have less room to move, they bounce back and forth more quickly, and they'll strike the lids of the container and the liquid phase twice as often. That means that they're going to have twice as many opportunities to dissolve, and we will wind up with twice as many dissolved. Another way to phrase that is to say that we have doubled the solubility of the gas. Because there's a direct relationship here between the pressure of the gas and its solubility in the liquid. A simple way of writing the relationship that we've seen between the solubility of the gas and the pressure of the gas would be to just state that they're equal. This would be true in a certain case. Let's say that we start out with pressure of one atmosphere and the solubility is one molar concentration at that pressure. Well, if we double the pressure, so we have two atmospheres, then we all have two molar concentration. That will be true. The only problem is that it might not be that these are exactly equal. There might instead be some ratio between them. So what we'd have to do is we'd have to measure the solubility at a particular pressure and determine that constant relationship. This would make this what's called Henry's Law. Uh, so now our equation is going to work in all cases, not just that special case where the solubility is exactly equal to the pressure. And as we saw before, now when we double the pressure, that's going to double this term, so that's going to double our solubility, which is the relationship that we established. And this constant here is going to depend on a few factors. It's going to depend on the type of our solvent. It's going to depend on the type of our solute. It's also going to depend on the temperature of the substance. So this is something that we're just going to have to look up for those special conditions. But once we know this constant, then we will be free to vary the pressure however we like, and we will automatically know how much of the gas will be dissolved in a liquid under those conditions. Consider a typical 12 ounce can of Coke. These are pressurized by the manufacturer up to 3.75 atmospheres at room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. In that case, what mass of carbon dioxide is dissolved in one of those 12 ounce cans. Well, the first thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to look up the constant which applies for CO2 dissolving in water at this temperature. Well, we do that and they might be in different units. It doesn't really matter as long as your units work out in the end. But one reference might give us 3.4 times 10 to the minus 2 molar units, that's concentration, per atmosphere. Now that we know that, we can apply Henry's Law, which tells us that the solubility of the gas is equal to that Henry's Law constant times the pressure of the gas above the solution. So plugging in here, plug in our KH value. I'm going to go ahead and write it as moles per liter instead of molarity. It means the same thing, but we're going to want to deal with these moles and these liters in a, another step. And we multiply that by the 3.75 atmospheres. So atmospheres will cancel out, and we will have 0.1275 moles per liter left over. 
And now we can apply dimensional analysis to get this moles per liter into grams because we were asked for the mass of the carbon dioxide. Okay, so to get rid of moles, we can multiply by the molecular weight, the grams per mole of CO2. And this is concentration of CO2, so we, we can do that. Then to get rid of the liters, we're gonna to want to multiply by the volume of the solution, which is our 12 ounces, and there's 33.814 ounces for every one liter. So let's just go ahead and check this here. So moles cancels, liters cancel, ounces cancel, and we're left with grams, which is what we wanted. So Dimensionally, we're pretty confident this is the answer. Now you can compare this to if we'd done the same calculation, but instead of doing this at 3.7 atmospheres, we'd done it at one atmosphere. At one atmosphere, we would have gotten an answer of 0.53 grams. So when you open a can of Coke, initially there's about two grams of carbon dioxide dissolved in the liquid and if you leave it out in your counter for a day or so, then one and a half grams of that will escape and only half a gram will remain in the solution. Temperature is also a very important factor determining the solubility of gases and liquids. We in fact saw that the Henry's Law constant was dependent on temperature, so we'll get different solubility values for it depending on what the thermometer says about our solution. Temperature is actually somewhat of a subtle effect in that we're going to get different results depending on what kind of solution we're dealing with. Well, let's say we're talking about an organic molecule. So we have some long chain of hydrocarbons, so nonpolar LDF forces, attraction between the molecules, basically proportional to the size of the molecule and how much contact they come into. When we have a cool solution, then those molecules have the opportunity to become nice and ordered. At some point, they'll even arrange themselves into solid and not move around too much. Now, if we heat the solution, then we'll introduce some disorder. We won't get quite the nice overlap of all the molecules that we have in the cool solution. Well, let's imagine now that we want to go ahead and try to dissolve a gas into these solutions. So our, our gas molecule in the hot solution, we can kind of sneak into this wide open area here without too much trouble. In our cool solution, we're gonna find that there's less space available. Now what we're gonna to have to do in either case, we're gonna to have to supply the energy to pull apart these molecules and make room for the gas. And once we insert the gas, we're gonna get a little bit of energy back because the gas will form some bonds with these neighboring molecules. At the very least, it will have some London dispersion forces. Forming bonds is always favorable. Those attractions will pay off a little bit, but it still remains the fact that our initial cost in order to insert this in the solution is much higher for the cool solution versus the hot solution where the molecules might already have the spaces available. So what that means is that the solubility is going to increase as we heat this substance and provide more access to these gas molecules. Water has a somewhat different effect. Recall that we have those hydrogen bonds in water. They're very strong and water will do its best to maximize all the hydrogen bonds which are able to form since that's so energetically favorable. Well, if we have a nice cool solution, and what that looks like is we get this very ordered arrangement where the hydrogens get to associate with the oxygens. And you can see that creates a lot of space where we can insert a molecule. Once we start heating the water, that causes some disorganization. And now we no longer have those spaces created by the structure. So as we increase the temperature and we disrupt those hydrogen bonds, then we remove the access that the gas has, and if we want to insert the gas, then we're gonna to have to supply the energy to pull all these 
water molecules apart and make room for it. And so what that means is that as we heat water, the solubility is going to do the opposite of what happens for the organic substances. Solubility is going to decrease for the gases. This is why when you heat a pot and you're approaching the boiling temperature, before it starts boiling, you see a bunch of gas bubbles bubbling up from the bottom. Those are mostly nitrogen, since the atmosphere is 70% nitrogen, approximately. And as you decrease the solubility of the gas in the water, eventually the solution becomes supersaturated, and then the gas molecules nucleate on the bottom of the pan and form bubbles, and those bubbles rise to the surface and escape. 